can't think of anyone um, that I'd rather have introduce me. Um, Bob and I had been friends for uh, even before I came out, and uh, we spent a lot of time talking together. And Bob has been an immense uh, wealth of information for me uh, in terms of really understanding what is going on in the field and at a very personal level, of course, what it means to be a person with a cervical spinal cord injury. And um, Bob has been a wonderful friend recently in particular because he's uh, helped us both personally and uh, uh, in general uh, with our uh, regeneration project that I'll tell you a little bit about today. So I'd like to just actually applaud Bob again because he really is, has been an immense leader. Thanks also to Marilyn and Donna. Uh, this is a really fantastic meeting. And um, for those of you who don't go to many meetings, I think that uh, you, this one, you, you need to know that this one is really quite special. Um, for those of you who have been to a lot of meetings, you already know that. It really is an opportunity to meet directly with uh, your, your colleagues, meet with us who are trying to uh, carry out research to uh, make a difference in spinal cord injury. And um, we hope you'll enjoy that time and, and take, a, take full advantage of it. Please let me say for all scientists that uh, we're here to talk to you. And we hope that you'll ask us any question. Put us on the spot. Make us answer you in the terms that you both understand and that you're satisfied with. So um, go for it throughout the meeting. And uh, on Saturday in particular, we'll be over at the Reeve Irvine Center to uh, spend some time talking with you directly. Um, do I have control of this? And, and let's see if I do. OK, I do. Look at that. Wow. OK, um, so uh, <laughs> just to say, um, this is just a photograph of some of the people at the Reeve Irvine uh, Center. And um, some of the ones you probably can't see here have little circles around their heads. So I'm, I, I won't try to do it um, now. Uh, but I will try to mention everyone's name who's been involved in this project as, as we go on. As Bob said, we have somewhere around 80 people working at our center right now in the different uh, labs of the principal investigators. And uh, it varies, of course, from time to time because we have a lot of students coming in and, and working with us. And, and some of them spend a few months, some of them spend their entire graduate career. So uh, knowing exactly what the number is at any particular time is kind of a moving target. Um, so um, what I'll tell you. For the first time, we've been able to achieve something that has really been the holy grail of regeneration research, and that is the ability to re, uh, achieve re robust regeneration of axons in the injured spinal cord. I would say that over the past three years, we've broken the regeneration barrier. And by we, I don't mean my lab in particular. I mean lots of labs working around the world, collaborating together. And uh, what you're going to be hearing about today I think is just the, the uh, first wave of studies that are going to be appearing over the next couple of years that are going to begin to impact how we treat the problem of spinal cord injury and how we begin to impact this major issue of regeneration. I'll just um, mention briefly some of the people. Our, whoopsie, our group uh, in, includes Yigong He and his colleagues. It's not going to let me do that have to be figure out what, which, what, what, what I can touch here and what I can't. So uh, let's see here. So uh, nope, it really isn't going to let me point. All right, I won't point. Um, so uh, our group uh, is a collaboration between Ji Gang He and his colleagues at Children's Hospital Harvard. I found it. Uh, sorry? Got it. I got it now, yeah. And, um, and then uh, my group here, and uh, I don't have it. Uh, and some of the names here, I, I really won't take the time to read them all because it would take half my talk. You know who you are, but uh, and uh, really a lot of these people are here. I did want to point out one person that, uh, that came all the way from Japan for this meeting, uh, Dr. Minoru Fujiki. I won't actually talk about our collaboration together, but just to say, uh, Dr. Fujiki is a neurosurgeon in Japan and uh, has been actually working with me on spinal cord injury. He and I actually carried out the very first spinal cord injury experiments in my lab. And, and thanks to you, Minoru, for, for getting our lab started on this whole thing. Um, I, I tell this story. Um, I asked him if he slept last night. What Minoru does is fly in from Japan, arrive in my lab in the morning, work all day, and then go home at night, back to Japan. I, you know, really, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an amazing dedication. And uh, just to say, it's been a lot of fun to re-engage our, our collaboration. 
Um, so, we are involved in what I call the corticospinal tract project, and the uh, goal here is to develop a therapy that will enable regeneration of this pathway that controls our ability to move. Unite to fight paralysis, okay? Paralysis, obviously, is the inability to move voluntarily. That's what most people mean when they say, I'm paralyzed. I can't do what my mind wants me to do. And it's the cortical spinal tract that really mediates that function. So paralysis fo following spinal cord injury is due to damage to the cortical spinal tract. That is the pathway that enables us to do everything. Apparently, it's not enabling me to point with this uh, thing, but at least I can hold it over here in, a, in the general direction. Uh, and so regenerating this pathway is really the best hope for restoring function. And really, we've, we've known that for 100 years, and we, we scientists have been working very hard on it, but so far have had little success until just the past couple of years. And what I'll tell you today, and, and what uh, uh, Murray will tell you in the next talk, and Jerry in the, in, uh, the talks later this morning, is that there are now ways to regenerate axons, and especially the corticospinal tract. So far, we've accomplished this in rodents. And if we can achieve this in people, it could restore the ability to move to millions of people who are affected by paralysis in general. So um, just to put this all in context, what, what are we talking about? So from the point of view of a spinal cord injury, the problem is really disconnection. Ah, thank you. Um, so what makes us move is signals in our brain. So this is an MRI of a person who's actually suffered a spinal cord injury. The spinal cord injury is here. Signals from our brain travel down our spinal cord, end on the motor neurons that directly innervate our muscles. When that pathway, that communication system, is interrupted, the signal stops. So here actually is a tracing of the injury in a, uh, in a mouse model. So uh, the corticospinal tract is actually labeled with a dye here. The spinal cord injury is here. And the important point is that the axons that carry information end above the level of the injury and do not get beyond it. And that's really the problem that we've all known about for over a century. What if? What if we were able <clears throat> to just induce this much regeneration? So I'm showing you this. This is the mouse that I, uh, another mouse, and so the injury site is here. And just compare the distribution of these corticospinal tract communications here. So in this case, the injury is still in the same place. If we go back here, notice where these axons end, and here where they are now. So not only have they grown down and butted up against the injury site and really filled in this space here, but they've also actually grown past the injury. And, and this is really what we have been able to achieve through the manipulations that I'll tell you about in a minute. So if you could do that in a person, if you could translate that directly, what we've done here is achieved re of a portion of the spinal cord, about two to three segments. So what would that mean? And just to put it in perspective of someone with a cervical level injury, you all know, uh, you, could, you all can relate to this with your own injuries and, and these kinds of things uh, would be different at different levels, but the, but the difference in terms of functional improvement would be similar. So with a cervical injury at, say, C5, the most common site of injury in people, if you had an injury you would, uh, at that level, you would uh, likely be dependent for pretty much everything, feeding, turning, transfers, water, pretty much everything. But if you could regenerate connections just two levels, two, down to C6, all of these things now, you're able to do independently. Just doing that could make a huge difference in terms of independence and quality of life. And you can make this same sort of list for every level of spinal cord injury. So although we haven't been able to regenerate connections all the way down the spinal cord at this point from a cervical level, still what we're, what we're already to able, to, able to achieve in rodents could make a huge difference for people. So, 
tell you briefly about the, uh, our interventions, and I think uh, doc, uh, Dr. Blakemore is going to be talking more about some of these pathways, but I'll just tell you the one that we've been working on together with Dr. Zhigong He. So one of the reasons that regeneration doesn't occur is that molecular pathways that could mediate regeneration are actually shut down in adult animals. So you think about this. During early development, you're growing. You're adding cells all over your body. And then you reach a point somewhere in your teenage years where your body stops growing. And there are signals that mediate this. And Dr. Shigang He, our collaborator, really was a genius in, in taking that very simple observation and saying, well, okay, let's just try to use some of these same molecular breaks and manipulate them and see if we can make it possible for nerve cells to grow again. So he began a, a screen of genes that were suppressors of cell growth. They're actually tumor suppressors. And he was able to find one in particular that when deleted, made it possible for nerve cells to actually regenerate their axons. And his first experiments were with this uh, P10 pathway. So uh, it actually regulates a, another molecular pathway called mTOR. So P10 is this little pink thing sitting here. And this little flat thing means that it's a break. It turns off this kinase pathway. And you, you can sort of follow all the arrows here. But the bottom line is that way down here, it leads to phosphorylation of a molecule that actually regulates protein synthesis. It's actually a molecule that's directly on the protein synthesis machine, the ribosome. And when that's phosphorylated, you're all of a sudden able to synthesize proteins that you couldn't before and activate cell growth. And as I'll tell you, also restore an ability to regenerate by neurons. So <clears throat> the proof of concept experiment actually came from studies of the optic nerve, the connections between our eye and our brain. And uh, this paper was an absolute breakthrough. It was published by uh, Kevin Park uh, in Zhigong's lab back in 2008. And what they showed here is that, first of all, in a control situation, these green things on the left over here at the bottom are the optic nerve axons that have been cut. And they just don't regenerate in the control situation. But in a mouse in which P10 had been deleted in the eye, what he was able to achieve was substantial regeneration many millimeters along the optic nerve. And this has actually been a very important assay that has been used by Zhigong's group, by uh, the group at the Miami Project, as a screen for interventions that enable regeneration. It's, a, it's an easier screen than trying to do it in the spinal cord injury situation in general. So what we did with them was to team up with Zhigong and actually do the same experiment in the spinal cord. And this work was actually published in Nature Neuroscience. Um, I'll show you the uh, images in just a second, but basically we found that deleting P10 also allows substantial regeneration, this time of the corticospinal tract, in mice. What I'm going to show you, actually, uh, is exactly what I showed you on those first couple of slides. So this time with details, and let me just tell you about the injuries that we're working with here and, and, and what we're doing. So these are complete crush injuries that I'm going to show you. Our paper actually involved two kinds of injuries, but the data that I'm going to show you is a complete crush injury. This is really what we all consider to be the highest bar for regeneration. A lot of the times we are working with partial injury situations, and these are great for screening. But with a complete crush injury, you've actually interrupted all of the connections between the brain and the spinal cord. And achieving regeneration in that setting is considered to be a, a major accomplishment. So hopefully, what do we, do we have anything? Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll go with it, okay. Um, so this is the situation that I showed you earlier on. Now I've turned, this is now a, a rat, I didn't, uh, or a mouse, I'm sorry. We've, we've, we are looking at the side of the spinal cord. The brain is somewhere over here. The feet are somewhere down here. And again, these axons are the corticospinal tract. And they've gotten to the point of the injury almost, but none of them are passing. And just to say that uh, this crush injury, as you can see here, is, is complete. And actually, to show that it's complete, you would have to really look at all of the different sections. But this is the, then the situation that we've been able to achieve in, in the mouse, again, this time with a little bit more detail. And the point is here that not only have we restored input above the lesion, the axons have grown closer to the injury, but they've also gone through. Now, I want to emphasize here this, this injury site. And, and just to say, we use mice because they're convenient to use for genetic purposes, but they're different than rats in one very important respect. 
they don't have the kinds of cavities that develop in people, in rats, and in really all other experimental animals that we've looked at. So they're great for screening studies, but we, we've always known that there's going to be a second thing to contend with when we get into critters that successfully model the human situation, and that is this cavity that forms at the injury site, and I know you've all heard about that. So um, we, um, we wanted then to move directly as directly as possible to a situation where we would be better able to model something that would actually perhaps be translatable. So to, the step story translation really does enhancement of regeneration improve recovery? Does this actually make a difference? Can the treatment be delivered in a therapeutically relevant time frame? What I didn't tell you is that we actually deleted these genes early in development and then did the lesion. So obviously not something that's going to be a therapeutically relevant intervention. You want to be able to do it after an injury, and obviously all of you would like to to be able to do it long after an injury in a chronic injury situation. And then three, is it possible to develop a therapeutic approach and deliver a system that might actually be uh, useful for human therapy? And um, we've done a lot of experiments over the past three years, but I'll just summarize the results of one that involves rats and that I think indicates that the answer to all three questions is tentatively Yes. So this is the work of Dr. Gail Lewandowski. She's sitting over here, and she'll be uh, available to talk to you later on in, uh, this afternoon and also on Saturday. So <clears throat> the, uh, as I said, the proof of concept experiment used genetically modified mice. So the first thing is how do we do it in a rat in a way that doesn't uh, require a previous genetic manipulation? And the way to do that is to actually build on advances in, in uh, gene therapy. So. What Gail did was to design what we would call an anti-gene, in a sense. So P10 is a gene. A gene makes a signaling molecule called RNA. RNA is the template to synthesize a protein. What Gail did was to create an anti-RNA, an anti-sense. And this uh, anti-sense RNA can be expressed in cells, including nerve cells. Um, and when it is expressed, what happens is that it actually binds to the target gene, and that causes that target RNA to be degraded. So you effectively delete the gene in the same way that you would experimentally. Now, the delivery is, is the question, and what Gail did was to design an AAV, an adeno-associated viral vector, that expressed this gene, and she used a particular type of AAV that is selectively taken up by nerve cells, and actually especially taken up by nerve cells in the cortex that give rise to the corticospinal tract. And when this is, uh, is done and, in, uh, and injected into the brain, what happens is that the AAV, shRNA, effectively deletes P10 in the same way that a genetic deletion would. So on this slide, uh, the top is just blue showing you the brain and cells. The next is a reporter that is just green um, and just tells you that that's where the AAV is. And again, that you might have trouble seeing this, but the, uh, this little blank spot right here is the area in which P10 has been deleted. So this is P10 immunostaining, that's the protein, and this little blank spot is where the gene has been effectively deleted. And what Gail did was to make a bunch of these injections all over the cortex and actually delete P10 throughout the area of the brain that gives rise to the corticospinal tract. And she did that after an animal, in this case a rat, received a cervical injury. So this is a model of exactly the kinds of injury that we were talking about in the beginning. A person experiences a cervical injury, loses upper extremity, hand function. Can we restore some level of that function? And um, so how do you test that with a, with a mouse? The, the problem, of course, with animal studies is that I can't say to the rat, please raise your hand, please squeeze my hand, please reach out and do that. So we have to train them. And in this case, the training was in something called a Montoya staircase. So um, what you do here is to uh, put the rat in, a, uh, in an environment here. They're on a little platform. Here, I'll try to show both sides. And then below the platform are uh, little... Uh, bins with, with goodies in it that rats love to eat. And you can see here that the uh, bins are uh, different colored, uh, have different colored pellets here. So what the rat has to do is from his platform, he has to reach down various distances to actually grab these goodies and then eat them. And a normal rat can learn to do this and uh, by a few sessions is able to actually reach down and get most of the pellets off the, um, off the 
the uh, ones that are close, and maybe miss a few pellets off the ones that are far away, but largely get to about 80% correct. So that's our task. And rats learn this and love this, and, uh, and it, it, it's actually quite enjoyable uh, to them. Well, at least the eating part. Um, so this is a great task for testing upper extremity function. And so what happens with the injury? Well, first of all, they lose the ability to do this. They actually become uh, impaired. I won't show you the early post-lesion uh, results because really they can't do anything. But over time, they start to be able to do uh, the recovery. And what you're looking at here are steps. So one is the easiest, six is the hardest, the deepest well into which they have to reach. And early on, um, what we see here is that all the rats in these three colored groups down here are at one level, and this little group up here is the red. Now I've got to tell you what else she did. So in addition to deleting P10, I told you that the other problem is this hole that we have in the spinal cord. So following up on earlier work by Dr. Kelly Sharp, and um, yeah, Kelly, help me. <laughs> there you are over there, looking around for it, yeah. Um, that showed that putting fibrin, fibrin glue actually, and in this case salmon fibrin, into the injury site actually improved that uh, setting for nerve regeneration. So what Gail actually did was to combine P10 deletion and fibrin in the injury site. So three of these groups are, are, are different. So one of them has, one of them is a control that expresses the, uh, uh, the control protein. One of them actually has P10 deleted. And this group has P10 and fibrin. So you see this group of the P10 and the fibrin are the red ones. And they're the ones that are starting to show improvement here at um, uh, just a couple of weeks after the injury. But then by 10 weeks after the injury, there's a huge improvement, a huge difference in the animal's ability if they got both deletion of P10 and the fibrin glue into the injury site. Now, I have to say that these are very preliminary data. The function is complete. Gail is actually still working, uh, at, well, not as we speak, but uh, pretty close to as we speak, on evaluating the anatomical uh, results. And I have to say, I just looked at a section yesterday, and, and it looks really, really exciting. And uh, hopefully, in a few weeks, we'll, we'll have the whole anatomical story. But just to say, this kind of puts it all together. So this was an intervention that was delivered after the lesion, not long after, but after the lesion. It actually combined the ramping up of the molecular pathways that enable regeneration with something else that improves the injury site. And I think uh, Jerry Silver will talk about other things to improve the injury site later on uh, in the conference. And then it assessed for limb function, which is hopefully the, uh, the signal that is our uh, best measure of corticospinal tract function. So kind of everything is together. It's not finished yet. <clears throat> but at least the answers are not no. It looks very promising, and, and we are um, uh, moving forward to try to finish this. So uh, just to wrap up, so I think does enhancement of regeneration improve recovery of function? I think we can say yes now, and, it, and not just from that experiment. We've actually done a, uh, a number of other experiments that are, that are all supportive of that conclusion, and again, all related to hand function. Can the treatment be delivered after a spinal cord injury? I think the answer is now yes. I think we can say that both, again, from this experiment and from other experiments that I didn't show you. Is it possible to develop a therapeutic approach and delivery system? Well, it depends on whether you think AAV is therapeutically relevant. Lots of people do think so, and in fact, AAVs are in clinical trials for other things. But that, of course, is the big next step, testing safety, testing efficacy of this manipulation. And really, the, um, there, there, there is a lot more to do in other uh, respects, too. So we need to work out specific details of how and when we might deliver this treatment. We need to determine how much recovery might be possible with the treatment. We need to develop interventions to overcome the significant barriers that remain. I talked about the fact that we're only getting regeneration for two to three segments in the mouse, and we'd love to be able to get things growing further. And I think we have ideas about how to do that by actually targeting different molecular pathways, some of which Dr. Blackmore is going to be talking about. And we need to determine whether all of this can be scaled up. So what do I mean by scaled up? Well, here's our scaling issue. This is a human brain, this is a mouse brain, this is a rat brain, and obviously the spinal cord is uh, uh, of quite different sizes. We all think and hope that the manipulations that we do, whether it be a regeneration-promoting intervention or a stem cell intervention, we all hope that it will translate by size. So the same intervention will cause 
a proportional increase that matches the size of the brain and the spinal cord with which we're working. But we need to actually show that. And of course, the ways to uh, begin to investigate that involve studies involve, uh, using non-human primates or at least large animals. And uh, those are things that need to be done. And um, as I say, we're all hopeful that the scaling will be something that actually does, uh, does work. So um, just to end, I'll uh, again show a picture of my lab. I want to mention uh, here uh, Dr. Kim Anderson. Kim helped us work out a lot of the forelimb assessments that we now use routinely for studying function after spinal cord injury. Kim moved to uh, the Miami Project, and uh, so if you visit the Miami Project, she's the one who will show you around down there. And uh, we, we miss her greatly, but uh, our, uh, celebrate her achievements to, to move on to something that uh, really is very exciting for her. Um, and then, um, finally, uh, welcome to California. I hope you'll see something like this later today. Um, it is a great day, I think, uh, once the uh, sun, once the fog burns off a little bit. And I hope all of you weren't too badly impacted by the travel situation. Thank you very much.